Welcome back to Godless Reads, the chilling tales for darknet show where different godless authors read their own stories. I'm Drew Steppen, the owner of godless.com and the godless app, and I'm also a horror author myself. And yes, I'm a dirty old man who's trying to win your love by acting fresh and cool. On this week's episode, we're bringing you something totally unique from Peter Caffrey, the British bulldog himself. Caffrey's been on Godless since day one. He has a series called Mondo Perverso. Mondo Perverso is an homage to 70s exploitation cinema and weird shit that went on in those days. So it's like going to a grindhouse movie without actually going to a grindhouse movie theater where you risk getting stuck to your seat by semen. On this episode of Godless Reads, Peter reads his Mondo Perverso title, Zombie, 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 I mean, who doesn't love a little fucking acid, man? This episode is an experience. So make sure you listen to everything. Zombie Cheerleaders on LSD is a preserved version of the original master. In other words, it's got coming attractions, an intro by director Terry Finicula, and you'll be glad to know that I didn't fuck it up with sound effects and shit. Kick back, grab your drug of choice, and get ready to trip balls with Peter Caffrey and Zombie 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 on LSD. On LSD. On LSD. On LSD. She-Devils of the Umpopo Delta. <laughs> These women are wild. These women are mean. These women are she-devils. And they've got a taste for man-meat. Travelling up the Umpopo River, the missionaries of St. Xavier's don't know the fate that awaits them. Captured, abused, tortured, and pegged with hand-carved tribal dildos, they soon realize the Delta is no place for God-fearing men. As the cannibal she-devils tuck in, a few missionaries soon realize the only way to escape their fate is to become the sexual plaything of the wild warrior women. Take your seats. The main presentation is about to begin. A message from the director. Hello, Terry Funicular here, the creative driving force behind Mondo Perverso, acclaimed underground filmmaker and director of Zombie Cheerleaders on LSD. Sadly, like all my life's work, the film is lost, consumed in the flames fanned by censorship cancel culture, and the petty jealousies of an intolerant right-wing society. If you're unaware of the tale of woe, the full story about the callous and politically motivated police raid on my studios can be found at mondoperverso.com. They might have taken away my films, but thanks to the fearless endeavours of godless.com and Peter Caffrey, the stories live on through this the second Mondo Perverso night out at the cinema without going to the cinema but with a similar feeling, albeit in a book experience. Last time out, we enjoyed Nympho Nurse's Ton Up Terror, and tonight we'll be revisiting what many critics claimed was a post-apocalyptic masterpiece, Zombie Cheerleaders on LSD. The film was made during what I like to call my transitional period, the earlier films were arguably more about me learning my craft, and the later movies were what many now refer to as classics in their genre. 
During the making of Zombie Cheerleaders, I knew enough to put out a decent film, but the freedom associated with my naivety allowed me to break rules which I didn't know existed. While well engineered, the film retains the exciting rawness which typifies many of my masterpieces. Interestingly, the original working title of this film was Zombie Cheerleaders Get a Travel Card. The story involved the zombie girls enjoying unrestricted travel on buses and the underground around the capital, obviously outside of peak hours, wreaking havoc as they went. I was on my way to London to shoot some location scenes when I saw two young girls hitchhiking. My first thought was to get them in the back of my van, but as I pulled up, two men jumped out of the bushes and got in with them. It transpired they were on their way to a rock festival. Although it wasn't in the direction I was heading, the men were insistent I took them all the way. We debated the matter in a lay-by, but I agreed to do it after they presented a scenario whereby they stripped me naked, tied me up, kicked the living shit out of me and took my van with all my equipment. I was a little hungover on the day, and as we arrived at the festival, the men suggested I purchase a little pick-me-up from them. I did think £10 for two Barocca tablets was a bit steep, but they insisted that was the going rate. Well, let me tell you, they weren't effervescent vitamin C tablets. No, sir. I stayed at the festival, tripping off my nut, and ended up getting some very surreal footage which made it into the final cut. Zombie Cheerleaders Get a Travel Card then became Zombie Cheerleaders on LSD. Prior to its launch, the film enjoyed a short residency in the private cinema room at Big Ben Bertie's Bum Bum Club, during which time it enjoyed rave reviews, with one leading expert in the field of art cinema calling it a definitive classic in the zombie genre, and suggesting I was the new George A. Romero. However, as is typical of many of my films, when it went on general release, the mainstream critics kowtowed to establishment pressure and slated it as exploitative, crass, puerile and pornographic. Remember, these were the same people who acclaimed Star Wars as a classic, despite it being a children's film based on the Keystone Cops in spaceships. One critic, from the less-than-well-esteemed Cleethorpe's Chronicle, went so far as to petition for the film to be banned due to the caravan sex scene. His claims it outraged public decency were enough to make most cinemas pass on showing the film. However, he wasn't so smug a few weeks later when his employer discovered child porn on his laptop. He claimed criminals had hacked his computer and planted images of a small boy wanking off a masked man in a wardrobe on his hard drive, but he was sacked from his job and placed on the register. How's your critiquing career now, you four-eyed, despicable cunt? Of course, a Mondo Perverso film wouldn't be a Mondo Perverso film without a little touch of intrigue. During editing, I was going through the many hours of footage shot during the festival, and I came across one scene where a naked woman rolls around in a sea of mud as a heavy metal group thrashed through a barnstormer of a set. At one point, the woman spotted me and, kneeling to face the camera, slowly rubbed mud over her breasts. I examined the footage, over and over again, for a few days. Then, on around the 57th viewing, I realised I'd seen her somewhere before. Despite the mud on her face and the shaky camera work, I believe she may well have been Raquel Welsh. I tried to verify whether it was indeed the sultry star of classics such as One Million Years BC and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I sent a message to Raquel asking if she'd been at the festival, got smashed off her face and cavorted naked in the mud while rotting fetus spunk played their set, but she didn't reply. I don't think her silence should be interpreted as a denial it was her. It might be she was embarrassed by her peculiar dance moves, or maybe admitting it was her would have caused a contractual issue. Either way, with the loss of the original footage, our guests will never be sure if she was there. However, she did go on to land a role in Date My Dad, and you don't get that sort of gig without having your profile raised. So, that's all from me. Enjoy Zombie Cheerleaders on LSD, recreated for you here as the second instalment of the Mondo Perverso Night Out at the Cinema, without going to the cinema, but with a similar feeling, albeit in a book experience.
Castle Fottock, the Virgin's Mount Archaeological Dig. I'm so excited, Glenda Gash announced as she squatted in the dirt alongside her friends from Beavertown High School. The annual field trip is always a blast, but this year it brings together the two things I love most, archaeology and cheerleading. What could be better? I know, giggled Selina Snatch as she carefully brushed some dirt away from the area she was investigating. First we get to spend the week with Professor Goodtime at the dig, then at the weekend we'll be participating in the regional cheerleading finals. It's enough to make a girl moist. The Professor makes me moist, Betty Box giggled. I'd be up for a good time with good time and no mistake. The three girls laughed at the thought of getting jiggy with the handsome academic, but it wasn't just his looks which had them excited. The Professor was well known for taking young students under his wing and mentoring them. Many of his previous prodigies now held well-respected positions in the archaeological community, his tutorship a credential many clearly valued. Winning his favour was key to a successful future. As the three fastidiously scoured their pegged-off areas for artefacts, Glenda kept one eye on the professor who was working on a nearby mud bank. He spent most of the morning excavating earth around a large boulder, even ignoring the coffee break to continue his work. It was unlike him to miss an opportunity to share his knowledge with the team, but something about the rock had obviously caught his attention. Glenda realised if she could involve herself and share his excitement for whatever he was investigating, it would put her at the front of the pack with regards to the students seeking a placement. The usual way to catch a professor's eye was to make a remarkable find, but it was unlikely on this dig. There were several school students on placement, and all had been allocated the plots least likely to contain any artefacts. This was her third day on the dig, and thus far she'd only found a shirt button, circa 1990. If Professor Goodtime was going to notice her, it would be because of her enthusiasm for his work. Selina and Betty would doubtless try to flirt with him. It was always their opening gambit whenever they wanted to achieve anything, but she could win him over by sharing his passion for archaeology. If he took her on as a research assistant, they'd spend more time together, and then she could consider how to win his heart. Gently removing dirt from her allocated area, Glenda's focus wasn't on her search. Instead, she daydreamed of a future as Mrs. Glenda Goodtime. She and the Professor would travel the world, solving the riddles of history, uncovering long-buried secrets, and writing groundbreaking papers on ancient civilizations. Their children would grow up to be world-acknowledged experts. A shout snapped her back into the here and now. It was the Professor calling for his assistant. Tarquin! he shouted. Tarquin, come quickly and give me a hand! Red-faced and breathing heavily, the professor wrestled with the large stone, which refused to move despite his best efforts. When Tarquin finally responded, he minced across the site, a stupid grin plastered across his face. Glenda watched him approach, loathing everything about the man. He had the ear of Professor Goodtime and received the academic's undivided support and attention, yet he seemed put out if asked to do any work. His position was enviable, one Glenda would do anything to enjoy, and yet he was nonchalant about his privilege. What is it? Tarquin asked, a little too glibly for Glenda's liking. Come over here and give me a hand shifting this stone, Professor Goodtime gasped. I think it's the entrance to the Virgin of Futtock's tomb. Tarquin glanced at the stone and tutted. It's a bit muddy, he whined. Anyway, it looks too heavy. Maybe we should move it tomorrow if we can get some heavy lifting equipment. Just give me a hand, the professor snapped. Tarquin took hold of the stone, but it was obvious he wasn't making much of an effort. His face bore an idiotic sneer, letting everybody know he couldn't be bothered to put any energy into the struggle. If the professor glanced up, Tarquin's facial expression quickly changed into a mock grimace, switching back to the inane smirk when he looked away again. Incensed by his attitude, Glenda jumped up and ran over. She wasn't as strong as the assistant, but at least Professor Goodtime would see she was making an effort. Selina and Betty spotted what she was doing and also headed over. It was typical of them, exploiting her initiative to ingratiate themselves with the professor. With the addition of the girl's assistance, the stone moved. It's going, the professor gasped with excitement. One more good heave and it might come free. Everyone increased their effort. Everyone except Tarquin, who kept up the pretense of toiling. And the rock moved a few more inches. 
It's too heavy, Tarquin muttered with a whimper. We should wait until we have the right equipment. Nonsense, Glenda hissed. If we all put our backs into it. One, two, three, heave, the professor chanted before he and the three girls threw their all into moving the stone. Tarquin stood idly by, no longer feigning any involvement. As they laboured, the rock moved another few inches. Again, Glenda barked, and the professor counted them in. Slowly but surely, the boulder edged away from the opening. Then, after a mighty heave, it dropped at an angle, becoming lodged in the hole. Despite further attempts, it didn't move again. Shit, the professor muttered, falling backwards and lying in the dirt, sweat sparkling on his face. Tarquin's right. We'll have to wait until the morning and use the heavy lifting rig. Thanks for your help, girls. Glenda's opportunity was slipping out of her control. If they waited until the morning, the professor would probably tackle the job with others who had experience of heavy lifting. She'd be sidelined, and her chance to win the attention of the academic would be lost. Glenda examined the gap between the rock and the opening. It would be a challenge, but she was sure she could squeeze through. Her dancing kept her slim and supple, and she'd always had a natural flexibility. As a child, whenever her father wasn't in prison, he'd force her to clamber through tiny windows into shops and businesses in order to let him in to rob them. Even when he was locked up, Uncle Tony would make her perform contortion exercises, naked, to keep her lithe. I could probably get through the gap, she suggested. Tarquin rolled his eyes. Can't you just peer through the hole? the assistant asked. Taking a torch from his pocket, the professor had a quick look. I can't see anything. We'll have to wait till tomorrow, he muttered, but his tone indicated he was deflated by the delay. I don't know how you'll be able to sleep without knowing what's in there, Glenda said, trying her best to come across as upbeat and positive. I know I won't. What we've been so close to discovering whether or not it's the tomb of the Virgin of Futtuk, that's why we're here, after all. The professor nodded, a sparkle in his eyes. Do you really think you can get through? he asked. I can try my best, she replied. That's all any of us can do, Professor Goodtime. She felt a quiver in her cunt as she said his name aloud. I like your attitude, young... Um, the professor said, furrowing his brow as he struggled to remember her name. Glenda, Glenda said. Glenda Gash. I like your attitude, young Glenda. As he said her name, she felt the moistness between her thighs. Running her hands round the edges of the small hole, she felt confident. She'd been through smaller gaps. It's tight, she muttered, licking her lips in a seductive manner. Nice and tight. It'll be a close thing. I need to strip down, though. Pulling off her t-shirt, she was glad she was wearing her wonder bra. Other bras are available. Today, it was lifting and separating like a motherfucker. Rolling her shoulders back so her breasts appeared larger, she glanced at good time. His eyes were enjoying the feast of flesh on show. With a cheeky smile, she undid her belt and let her shorts fall to the ground. Whenever Uncle Tony babysat and forced Glenda to catwalk in various states of undress, he always told her to ensure her underwear matched. With Professor Goodtime ogling her black lace and red ribbon bra and panties, she was glad she'd listened to the advice. After a few stretches, done more to attract the professor's admiring glances than to limber up, she wriggled into the darkness. The gap was smaller than she thought, the angle of the stone tightening up as she entered the tomb, but after some effort she managed to drop inside. I need a torch, she said. It was the professor's face which appeared at the hole. Passing a flashlight through, he couldn't conceal his excitement. What's in there? he asked. Is it the tomb? Glenda flicked on the torch and edged down the short passageway, emerging into a larger room. Panning the torch around the space, the finger of light illuminated a plethora of treasures. The tomb was littered with an array of objects, stone plates and bowls, metal goblets and jugs, bundles of cloth and rotting wooden effigies. At the far end of the chamber was a stone dais, on which sat an elaborately carved sarcophagus. "'It's the Virgin's tomb!' Glenda whispered, her voice trembling with exhilaration. There's a lot of artefacts in the stone coffin. It's glorious. She heard the professor sigh. Pass me your phone, she said, and I'll take some pictures. No, Goodtime replied. Don't expose anything in there to a flash. 
Tomorrow we can move this rock and start cataloguing what we've found. Now, carefully, make your way back out. As Glenda moved back towards the hole, she screamed. What's wrong? the professor asked, his voice suddenly raising in pitch as panic flooded through his guts. Did you break something? No, Glenda replied. Something hairy brushed past my leg. It's probably a rat, Goodtime said. Stay calm. It'll be more afraid of you than you are of it. As she edged closer to the way out, a sharp pain shot through her foot, a spike of agony making her leg buckle. It bit me, she screeched. Calm down, the professor cooed, but a wave of adrenaline made Glenda leap towards the hole. Scrabbling as if for her life, she wriggled through the gap and fell to the ground, her sweating body coated with dirt and dust. As her eyes struggled to adjust to the sunlight, she felt arms embracing her. Professor Goodtime had lifted her and was carrying her towards the parking area. Shall I get one of the van drivers to take her back to the campsite? Tarquin asked, jogging to keep up with the professor's lengthy stride. No, Goodtime responded. I'll take her myself. Looking into Glenda's eyes, he smiled and said, I'll get one of the first aides to clean the wound and then you can have a rest in my trailer. Glancing at Selina and Betty, Glenda winked. It was worth suffering a rat bite to get personal attention from the professor. Orchard Rest Campsite A few members of the archaeology team stood at the edge of the track leading into the Orchard Rest Campsite, watching the activity in the next field. As Professor Goodtime approached, a balding, pot-bellied, respectable man turned, glanced at him and shrugged. I don't think we'll be getting much peace and quiet, he muttered, jerking his thumb towards the crew building the stage. Look at this lot. What's going on, Bob? Goodtime asked. I called in the Rosie in the campsite office. Turdy Farm is holding the Gallstoneberry Festival this weekend. Is it a medieval loot festival? Afraid not, Bob replied. Apparently it's been headlined by some popular beat combo called Zed Leppelin. I've never heard of them, but she said they play heavy mental. I think it's some sort of Belgian jazz. That's all we need, Goodtime muttered. I dare say the place will be awash with beatniks smoking marijuana cigarettes and bashing their bongos. Still, it's not all bad news. I think we found the Tomb of the Virgin. Mind you, we ended up with a casualty. A rat bit one of the placement girls. She's in the first day tent now. What was in the tomb? Bob asked, becoming more animated. I don't know. I couldn't get through the gap, but Glenda managed to climb inside. That's when she was bitten. Once a wound is dressed, I'll be able to find out a bit more. In the meantime, can you arrange for a pulley system to be ready for the morning? We need to shift a boulder blocking the entrance. Will do, Bob said, before returning to his colleagues. Professor Goodtime strolled back to the first aid tent just as Glenda emerged, still wearing nothing but her underwear. Her face was white, a sheen of sweat glistening across her brow. The episode with the rat had clearly unsettled her. Reaching out an arm, the professor guided her towards his trailer. You need to rest, he murmured softly. You don't want to be in an overcrowded tent tonight. You can stay in my caravan. Let's get you settled in, then I'll arrange some food and we can talk about the tomb. Glenda nodded, allowing the handsome academic to steer her towards the large caravan at the centre of the site. Despite the late afternoon sun, her entire body felt cold, the biting chill eating through her muscles and into her bones. The shock of what happened in the tomb, coupled with her skimpy clothing, weren't helping. Once in the van, Professor Goodtime showed Glenda to the sleeping area. Use my bed, he said with a sympathetic smile. Don't worry, the sheets are clean. Get some rest and I'll sort out some food. You'll feel better once you've eaten something and had a hot drink. Is there anything you fancy? Glenda's guts gurgled at the thought of eating anything, but she didn't want to be awkward. I'll, I'll have anything, whatever you're having. As she curled up in the bed and pulled the duvet around her, a negative thought crept into her head. If the professor knew how sick she was feeling, and she was experiencing a surprising level of discomfort, he'd insist she saw a doctor, or worse, went home. Leaving the dig meant missing out on opening the tomb, and her chance to get closer to Professor Goodtime would disappear. No matter how bad she felt, it was critical she showed a brave face and struggled through. 
As the door to the caravan clicked shut, she drew the covers around her, willing her body to warm up. The pulsating nausea was growing more intense, but some food might increase her strength. Outside, Professor Goodtime strolled over to the campsite shop. Bob was there, perusing the selection of local wines on sale. "'How's the patient?' he asked. "'She's resting,' Goodtime replied. "'I'm just getting us some food.' Bob raised his eyebrows. "'Just be careful, John. "'The last thing you need is some slip of a lass "'claiming you took her into your caravan and... "'Well, you know what she could say. "'Remember what happened to Professor Carmichael. "'Although there wasn't a shred of evidence "'he'd sodomised the cross-eyed boy with a lisp, "'he never worked again. "'Mud sticks!' I don't think she's the type to go making up stories, John Goodtime said. She might still be at school, but she's got her head screwed on. Her passion for archaeology is clear, and without tooting my own horn, I think she's desperate to get a research student place on my team. Just make sure if your horn does get a toot, it's not her tooting it, Bob said, before walking away. John Goodtime picked up a selection of sandwiches and a box of custard tarts. After paying, he headed back to the caravan. Once inside, he tried to be as quiet as he could as he made a pot of tea. Bob's words were stuck in his memory, looping as he waited for the kettle to boil. Despite Glenda's young age, she had the body of a woman, and thinking about her dress in her bra and panties gave him a semi. She was probably still a virgin, which was apt given she'd helped him to open the virgin's tomb. For a second, the thought of deflowering her on the sarcophagus popped into his head, her tight virgin cunt gripping onto his cock as he forced it into her, but he pushed the idea out of his mind. He was a professional for fuck's sake, and she was a schoolgirl. It was inappropriate for him to even fantasise about her. With the tea made, he carried the pot and the sandwiches over to the bed. Glenda hadn't moved since he'd come in, but he figured it was more important she ate something than slept. Glenda, he said loudly but with a soothing tone, I've got some sandwiches, tuna and sweet corn or bacon and tomato. As he waited for her response, he spotted something on the floor. It was her bra and knickers. The thought of her naked body in his bed made his cock twitch, the semi becoming a full-on erection. Glenda, he said with increased volume, do you need a robe? She didn't respond or move. Feeling awkward due to her nakedness, and ashamed of his state of inappropriate arousal, he backed away. Pouring a cup of tea, he went outside and sat on a camping stool, watching the comings and goings of the campsite while he sipped his drink and ate the bacon sandwich. Most of the team had returned from the dig, and the sun was setting. Glenda had been sleeping for a good few hours, and John Goodtime was anxious to wake her. He'd feel better once she had some clothes on, and he wanted to know more about what was in the tomb. With hindsight, he regretted letting her rest in his caravan. Having a naked schoolgirl in his bed wasn't the smartest of moves, not in the current age of witch hunts against paedophilic professors. Spotting Tarquin approaching, he tried to smother his anxiety. We're all off to the pub in ten minutes, Tarquin said. Will you be joining us, or are you spending the evening with her indoors? Although Tarquin's comment was clearly a joke, John couldn't help but feel unsettled. Such quips might be made in jest, but it was the sort of thing which caused people to talk. His career was on an upward trajectory, and there were plenty of envy-ridden academics who'd happily spread salacious stories if it meant stealing a chunk of his research budget. "'That's neither funny nor appropriate,' John snapped. "'These placement volunteers are under our care, and I expect them to be treated with the same degree of respect as we afford to other members of the team.' Tarquin's grin faded. Are you coming or not? he asked without humour, clearly pissed off with the admonishment. I'll be over shortly. As Tarquin skulked away, John went back into the caravan. Glenda was still concealed by the bundle of covers. Glenda, wake up, he said loudly. Glenda didn't move. Reaching out, he carefully shook the lump beneath the covers. There was no reaction. Regretting ever having let her into the caravan, he slowly peeled back the duvet to uncover her face. Glenda's dull eyes stared at the ceiling, a twisted grimace etched on her face. From her mouth and nostrils, a greyish foam bubbled. It smelled of decay, a foul stink of rot and shit. Panic surged through John's body. Reaching out a trembling hand, he took hold of her wrist and checked her pulse. He couldn't detect anything. 
Fighting the urge to scream, he tried again. Nothing. She was dead. Before he could react, a pulse of nausea hit, a gurgling jet of puke shooting across the bed. His mind raced, not at the shock of her death, but at the realisation his situation wasn't good. There was a naked schoolgirl dead in his bed. What the fuck was he going to do? Picking up her underwear, his first thought was to dress her. It would look better than her being naked. Whipping back the covers, the same grey foam bubbled from her cunt and anus. Despite the dread overwhelming him, his cock twitched as it stiffened. He tried to suppress his arousal, but a nagging thought pushed itself to the front of his mind. What would it feel like to sink his prick into a tight, foamy, dead cunt? A tremble shook his entire body as he emitted an involuntary whimper. It was wrong, too wrong to even be considered, but he wanted nothing more than to feel her foamy dead snatch around his fuckstick. It was disgusting, a violation of human decency, a crime so despicable he was shocked he could even think about it. But on the day he'd found the virgin's tomb, he now had the chance to deflower a dead virgin, one with a foamy cunt. It was more than just a coincidence. He couldn't fuck a dead girl, could he? No, he couldn't. It was reprehensible to even think about it. But maybe he could have a quick wank. It wouldn't make her any more dead if he cracked one off, would it? Pulling out his throbbing cock, John Goodtime set about himself as he gazed at Glenda's frothing gash. The urge to be inside her, to fill her dead hole with his spunk, was overwhelming. As he jerked faster, he thought about splashing his seed over her tits. No one would know. She was so pretty, and if she'd been alive, she probably wouldn't object. She might even enjoy the attention. As he furiously jerked his cock, he bent down and sniffed her twat foam. It had the same scent of decay and effluent, but it also had a tinge of sexy musk and a rousing hint of sweaty passion. It was intoxicating. Reaching out his tongue, he let the tip touch the foam, savouring the phenolic twang. Unable to control his passion, he slurped up the grey sludge, enjoying the taste and letting the bubbles burst as the guns trickled down his gullet. His passion was about to peak, a river of fuckoos ready to erupt from his tingling member. It was too much to bear, and as if guided by an invisible force, he leapt onto the bed, sinking his prick between her creamy piss flaps as he exploded. Trembling, he panted like a mad dog as spasms fired out globs of sex snot into a dead cunt. However, his passion was destroyed by a hefty knock on the caravan door. Pulling up his trousers, Professor Goodtime threw the duvet back over Glenda's body. Taking deep breaths, he composed himself and opened the door. Selina and Betty stood there. Hi, Professor Goodtime, Betty said. We've come to see how Glenda is. She's fine, he whispered, but she's sleeping. In fact, I'm just on my way out to give her some peace. We'll sit with her for a while, Selina said. With those words, John Goodtime's world imploded. The girls would realise their friend was dead and call the authorities. The police would take the body away before he could clean his spunk out of her twat. He needed to make sure the girls didn't get into the caravan. We're all going to the pub, he said, trying to sound upbeat and casual. Why don't you come with us? But we're only 15, Betty said. Don't worry about that, John muttered. I'll get you a couple of drinks and we can have a chat while Glenda rests. Tomorrow, I'm sure she'll be feeling better and everything will be back to normal. The girls looked at him and a feeling of panic bubbled up in the pit of his stomach. Come on, please join us, he urged. I've been looking forward to chatting to you both. Flashing his cheesiest smile, he waited while they looked at each other and shrugged. OK, Selina said with a giggle, let's go, but don't think about plying us with drinks and trying it on. Perish the thought, the professor said, as he closed and locked the caravan door. Intermission Our usherettes sell a full range of refreshments, as well as tobacco products and alcohol. This week only, we have a range of half-priced donuts. Yeah, they're out of date, but you can pick the green bits off. Look, it's a cheap donut. What more do you fucking want?
ladies. Tired of having a dribble every time you cough? Worried about the clunge gunge after you've done a yoga class? Fed up of a damp gusset every time you go on a trampoline? Fear no more. What you need is the Minge Mop. Discreet, portable and hygienic, the Minge Mop has been designed by Leaky Ladies for ladies who leak. The mop head can be easily replaced so it will keep you fresh, even if it's a bit like Billingsgate Fish Market down there. Had more pricks than hot dinners? You'll be glad you popped a Minge Mop in your handbag. And for you busy ladies on the go, there's the Minge Mop Plus with a vibrating handle which doubles as a butt plug. The Minge Mop, remember, it's not available in the shops. Wiping your growler with a manky old mop head does not prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Got a tiny cock. Come too quickly? Got more hair coming out of your ears and your nostrils and on your head? You need a shiny red sports car. Do the ladies tell you it happens to all men? Well, it doesn't. It's just you, you weakling. But it won't happen if you get yourself a shiny red sports car. Worried other people are laughing at your erectile dysfunction? Well, here's the reality. They are, because you're pathetic. Go out now and get yourself a shiny red sports car. Worried that friends, family and work colleagues know about you molesting children? They fucking do. And they hate you, you miserable piece of shit. There's only one way to get out of this. Buy yourself a fucking shiny red sports car. Owning a shiny red sports car may cause other people to shout wanker at you. Gentlemen, please retake your seats. The main presentation is about to continue. The Dog and Duck Selina and Betty split from the archaeology crowd after 15 minutes. Despite Professor Goodtime saying he wanted to chat to them, he mumbled something about collecting Glinda's rucksack from their tent when they got back, before spending the next ten minutes staring in silence at his pint. For a quiet country pub, the dog and duck was lively. Young people packed the bar area. A group of long-haired, tattooed lads wearing leather jackets sat at a corner table, watching the girls' every move. They beckoned the pair over once they drifted away from the professor. Hi, ladies, one of them said. I'm Terry. Why don't you join us? The girls settled at the table. I'm Selina and this is Betty, Selina said, and we'd like a couple of ciders. Terry fished in his pocket, handing some money to one of his mates. Get the girls a drink, he instructed, before turning back to them. You here for the festival? No, said Betty. We're here as part of an archaeological dig. The festival's on all weekend, Terry said. Surely you won't be working all weekend, will you? Oh no, Selina interrupted. We're leaving on Saturday morning to take part in a cheerleading competition. Cheerleaders, eh? One of Terry's friends muttered with a leer. Well, Zed Leplin are playing on Friday night, Terry said. Why don't you come and watch them, and then you can set off as planned on Saturday morning. We can make a party of it. What do you say, girls? Betty and Selina glanced at each other, giggling. I don't see why not, Betty said. Our friend Glenda will be with us too. Is that okay? The more the merrier, Terry replied with a smile. That's what I always say, don't I, lads? You do, one of the others said with a salacious grin. So this friend of yours, she not come out tonight? Terry asked. No, Selina said, taking a swig of her cider. She's back at the campsite, probably asleep. 
Did she have a hard day digging up relics? The lad who'd bought the drinks asked. Actually, she's not well, Betty replied. She was bitten by a rat. The lads looked at each other before bursting into a fit of hysterical laughter. Don't laugh, Selina snapped. It's not funny. It's fucking hysterical, Terry said, tears of mirth rolling down his cheeks. As the girls chatted more about the festival, Professor Goodtime wandered over. Tapping Betty on the shoulder, he leaned in and whispered in her ear, I'm thinking of heading back to the campsite. I need to prepare some things for the morning, and I want to get Glenda's rucksack for her. We're not ready to go yet, Betty said, surprised that the professor's intentions call it a night so early. I can sort out Glenda's stuff in the morning, but if she's feeling better, it won't really matter, will it? The professor sighed. I suppose not. If you're going to stay, ask Tarquin to give you a lift back when he leaves. You might as well stay for a while, Terry said, winking at the girls, who giggled and nodded. With that, Professor Goodtime walked away. I'm nipping outside, one of the boys said, lifting his fingers to his lips in a smoking motion. Terry nodded and stood. Why don't you pop out with us, he asked the girls. We've got something a bit special, if you know what I mean. Selina and Betty weren't sure what he meant, but they followed the others out into the car park. As they huddled in a group, Terry produced a spliff from his pocket. Lighting it up, he inhaled deeply before blowing out a cloud of pungent smoke. Taking another hit, he passed the joint to Betty. She wanted to refuse, to explain she didn't do drugs, but the peer pressure was enormous. Not wanting to isolate herself from the group, she took a long drag on the joint before exploding into a hacking cough. As the others laughed, the light-headedness crept over her. Within minutes, both her and Selina were giggling along with their newfound friends. Once the joint was finished, Terry led them all back into the pub. On Friday night, for Zed Leplin, we've got something really special for you to try, he said. I can't wait, Betty replied, a stupid grin fixed on her stone face. Me neither, added Selina. Bring it on. Back at Orchard Rest Campsite Professor Goodtime hurried to his caravan. Glancing around, he made sure no one was watching before unlocking the door and slipping inside. Even though it was dark, he didn't switch the light on, afraid to face the dead girl in his bed. What the fuck had he been thinking? It was bad enough he'd brought an injured schoolgirl back and allowed her to sleep in his caravan. He'd been naive, and as Bob had pointed out, he'd opened himself up to malicious gossip. To compound his problems, he hadn't told anyone she'd died, and then, like a fucking stupid fool, he'd had sex with the body. This was going to cost him his job, his liberty, and maybe even his life. How would the other prisoners react to a pretty boy who'd raped a dead child? His bummer would resemble a blood orange after a few days of his sentence. Getting shanked in the shower would come as something of a relief, his death freeing him from a life of torment on the nonce's wing of the prison. Trembling, nauseous, racked with guilt and shame, he stood in the dark, trying to think through his next move. The first thing he needed to do was clean the body, making sure he removed any trace of his spunk from her cunt. Then, if he could get hold of her rucksack, he could say she'd gone home. That would buy him a few days to get rid of the body. Alternatively, he could claim she'd died while he was at the pub, but if the police took away her body, would tests reveal what he'd done? Acidic bile gurgled in his gullet curdled vomit rising from his bubbling guts. Dashing into the toilet, he puked, much of it missing the bowl. Heaving until nothing else came up, he staggered back towards the kitchen area. Switching on the light, he fetched a bottle of milk from the fridge and rinsed out his mouth, before gulping down half a pint. Turning, he shuffled towards the bed, before the realisation hit him. Glenda was gone. It took a few seconds to sink in. She was gone, which meant... She wasn't dead. He'd checked her pulse, but he couldn't have done it correctly. She must have woken up, realised she was alone and gone back to her tent. She was alive. Thank you, God, John Goodtime muttered, clasping his hands together in a prayer of thanks. Glenda was still alive, which meant she'd know he'd raped her. Another surge of nausea had him dry heaving. He needed to find out if she was going to tell anyone. Maybe she wouldn't. Maybe she'd be flattered by his interest in her. If he involved her in the work at the tomb, if he offered her a role on the team, if he pretended to be in love with her, maybe she'd remain silent. 
Outside, he heard Tarquin's van pull up, along with a chatter of voices. The others had returned from the pub. It was too late to find Glenda. If she was going to tell anyone about her ordeal, it would be now. If she intended to make an accusation, there would be a knock on the door and questions to answer. With tears streaming down his face, Professor Goodtime sat on the edge of his bed, waiting for the dreaded knock. He waited all night, and by the time dawn broke, no one had come, and he had no more tears left to cry. Goldstoneberry Festival, Turdy Farm Terry and his mob of wannabe rock and rollers sat outside their tent, enjoying a lunchtime bong. Soon the music would start, culminating in the long-awaited appearance of heavy mental demigod Zed Leplin. Do you think the girls will turn up? Charlie asked, his eyes already glazed over from the breakfast hash cakes. I don't see why not, Terry muttered, passing the bong to his friend. They seemed keen enough last night. But will they wear their cheerleaders' outfits? Freddy asked. Well, they lost the bet, so they should, Terry replied. His face cracked into a leering grin as he remembered the race to down pints. Selina and Betty had been pathetic at it, spilling most of their cider, and the forfeit was for them to wear their costumes to the festival. I want first crack at Betty, Freddy said. And I'm going first on Selina, Terry chimed in. Dibs on sloppy seconds with both of them, Charlie snapped before descending into a fit of laughter. Isn't there another one, Glenda or Gloria or something like that? Andy asked as he struggled out of his tent. Apparently so, Terry muttered as he blew out a cloud of smoke. Well, I'm guessing that's her, Andy said, pointing towards the path between Turdy Farm and Orchard Rest Campsite. A girl in a cheerleader outfit staggered along the track. Dishevelled and moving in an awkward manner, she looked like she'd had a heavy night. Looks like our Glenda's a bit of a goer, Terry giggled. I might reconsider me options. But last night, didn't they say she stayed behind to get some sleep? Charlie asked. If that's what she looks like after an early night, she'll be a right fucking wreck once we spike her. Maybe, maybe not, Terry mused. I have a feeling our girl Glenda might be a bit of a dark horse. The lads watched as Glenda staggered off the road and disappeared into the trees. As they debated whether it was worth following her, the vans from the dig returned to the campsite. As the occupants got out, Terry walked over to the fence. When he saw Selina and Betty, he waved, and the girls made their way over to him. "'You still on for tonight?' he asked. "'Yep,' Betty said with a grin. "'I'm looking forward to it.' "'And you'll be wearing your cheerleading outfits? You did lose the bet, after all.' Both girls nodded, giggling as they did. Oh, one slight change of plan, Selina said. Glenda won't be coming. She went home last night. Glenda? Terry asked. Tallish girl, dark hair, decent sized tits, also a cheerleader. That's her, Betty said. She hasn't gone home, Terry replied, a little confused. Me and a lad saw her, not five minutes ago. She had a cheerleader outfit on, a bright yellow one, and she was heading into the woods. Our uniforms are yellow, Selina said, nodding. But I don't know why Glenda would go into the woods. Maybe she needed a shit, Terry suggested. I doubt she'd do a poo in the woods, Betty said. She won't use the campsite toilets without bleaching the seat, and even then she hovers. She looked a bit wasted, Terry added with a grin. Maybe I should come with you, just in case she's curling one out. We'll be fine, Betty said, caught somewhat off guard by the conflicting information about Glenda. You get back to your mates and we'll look for her. Don't forget to change into your outfits, Terry said. A bet is a bet. We're going to get changed right now and we'll be over as soon as we've found Glenda. Don't forget to get us some drinks, Betty said with a grin. As the girls headed off to their tent, Terry laughed and muttered to himself, Oh, I'll get you a drink, all right. I'll get you a drink that'll have you tripping off your fucking heads. Deep in the woods. Once changed, Betty and Selina searched the woods, splitting up in order to cover more ground. Betty headed away from the campsite towards the river. If Terry was right and Glenda was wearing her cheerleading uniform, she'd be clearly visible. However, there was no sign of her amongst the trees and bushes. As she walked towards the sound of running water, Betty mused on Glenda's mysterious disappearance. 
She'd been in Professor's Good Times caravan when they went to the pub and wasn't in their tent when they'd got back, but her rucksack had been opened and her clothes were strewn around. They thought the Professor had collected some bits for her, but at breakfast he was surprised she hadn't spent the night with them. Throughout the day he'd asked several times if they knew where she was. The only explanation seemed to be that she'd decided to go home. Would she have gone home without taking her belongings? She was usually very organised, so something didn't add up. Now, Terry's claim he'd seen her changed everything. He knew their cheerleading uniforms were yellow, which was correct, and while they got changed, Selina checked Glenda's rucksack. Her outfit was missing. Whatever had happened, the important thing was to find her friend and make sure she was okay. Reaching the river, Betty walked along the bank. Every now and again she'd shout Glenda's name, but there was no response. Coming around a bend, she spotted an outcrop of rocks ahead. Sitting on it, gazing into the water, was a figure dressed in a yellow cheerleader uniform. Picking up her pace, Betty jogged towards the figure. The dark hair meant it wasn't Selina, so it could only be one person. Glenda, she called. Glenda, it's me. I've been looking for you. Glenda didn't look up. Betty increased her pace, only slowing when she reached her friend. Glenda, are you OK? Sitting next to her, Betty touched her friend's hand. It was ice cold, as if made of stone. Jesus, Glenn, you're freezing, she said, rubbing her friend's arm. Glenda turned and looked at her with dead eyes. Her skin was white, not pale, but a similar colour to sun-bleached animal bones. Her lips were thin and grey, her teeth chattering. Let me warm you up, Betty said, as she wrapped her arms around her friend, pulling her close. For a second, Glenda's body was rigid, as if resisting the embrace, but then it relaxed and she felt breath on her neck. Despite the iciness of her body, the breath was hot and feverish, and carried a stink like decaying meat. It reminded Betty of her father when he came home after a hard day at the abattoir. Christ on a bike, Glen, Betty muttered. What the fuck have you been eating? You smell like... Before she could finish her sentence, Glenda's mouth clamped onto her windpipe, teeth tearing into her throat. Along with a surge of screaming agony, bubbling gore filled her throat, a taste of dirty copper coating her tongue as the pain spiked. She tried to push Glenda away, but her friend possessed an unnatural strength, pinning her down as she chewed and gnawed at Betty's ripped and torn neck. The pain was intense, but she also felt something strange. A warmth was growing in her groin, her cunt tingling as if she was in the throes of passion. As Glenda slurped down her blood and bodily fluids, Betty found herself pouring at her own undercarriage, her fingers stroking her gash as the bloodlust increased. Glenda's snapping mouth moved up, her blood-smeared teeth biting off a chunk of Betty's lip before moving on to her nose. Glenda chewed through the flesh and gristle like a starving dog who'd just caught a rabbit. Betty could feel her friend's tongue licking frantically inside her face, as if she was trying to get past the bone and reach... her brains? As the excruciating pain peaked, Betty's body was racked by the most intense orgasm she'd ever experienced. Then it was quiet the world suddenly still. Everything was perfectly peaceful. Selina didn't like the woods. The path was thick with gooey mud and the trees and bushes were alive with creepy crawlies. If the truth be told, she'd only agreed to come to the dig because Betty and Glenda had been so insistent. The thought of camping filled her with dread. The sooner they found Glenda and went to party with the lads at the festival, the better. Tomorrow they'd head off to the cheerleading regional finals and she'd be back in the bosom of civilization. They'd have proper toilets, hot water and stable Wi-Fi connections. Glenda, where the fuck are you? She shouted, somewhat half-heartedly. Betty was arguably a closer friend than Glenda. She'd been at primary school with Betty and they'd gone to ballet classes at the weekend. When Betty suggested they try out for the cheerleading squad, she'd agreed and they'd met Glenda as a result. Then, for some reason, Betty grew fascinated with Glenda's passion for archaeology and the fear of missing out had pushed Selina to get involved. Now she was tramping around a muddy wood, searching for them instead of enjoying the intention of the boys at the festival. Glenda? Betty? Anyone? Her cries were met with an eerie silence. There was no point walking further into the woods. Her shoes would be ruined and she'd end up getting lost. The best option was to head over to the festival and meet up with Terry and his friends. 
At least Betty would know where to find her once she'd given up on this fool's errand. Glenda was probably at home, as the professor had suggested. There was no logical reason she'd be wandering around in the woods. I'll give them five more minutes, she muttered to herself, before once more repeating the ritual of shouting their names. Through the trees, Glenda and Betty followed the sound of Selina's voice. Holding hands, ice-cold fingers entwined, the pair made their way towards the repeated calls. The two glanced at each other and grinned, their mutual hunger and lust driving them onwards. They were close, so close they could smell a musk. Glenda drooled at the thought of the feast which lay ahead. Spotting the flash of yellow uniforms, Selina put more effort into her shouts. "'Girls, over here!' she screeched, hopping up and down and waving her arms. Her friends didn't wave back, but they headed towards her. Neither of them looked in a good state. Glenda seemed washed out, and Betty looked as if she'd been in an accident. There was blood dripping from her throat, trickling down the front of her outfit, and her hair was knotted and dishevelled. Selina sighed. Betty's injuries would delay them getting to the festival. By the time they arrived, Terry and his mates would probably have found some other girls to fawn over. Despite her frustration, she tried her best to appear empathetic. Oh, what happened, babes? There was no response. Glenda and Betty looked in a horrific state, but they were both grinning, a malevolent, vicious, unsettling grin. For a moment, Selina froze, an unexpected terror gripping her soul. Then she turned to run, but before she could get any inertia, she felt the weight of her friends pulling her down. In her head, she pictured a lone gazelle being dragged to the ground by ferocious lions as she dropped like a sack of wet shit. The pair of friends tore open her flesh, gulping down her blood and bile and bodily fluids, munching on her organs, sucking up her cerebrospinal fluid. The torturous pain built, as did the orgasmic tingling in her nether regions. The agony became ecstasy, and her wails of pleasure echoed through the canopy of the trees. The Cuboid Stage, Gallstoneberry Festival, Turdy Farm. As rotting fetus spunk finished their set, the drugged-up crowd bade for an encore. One woman, taken to another level by their cacophonous noise, rolled naked in the mud at the front of the stage. Smearing muck over her pendulous breasts, her cavorting caught the eye of many. "'Is that Rackle Welsh, star of one million years BC?' one asked. I doubt it, another said. Why would she be here making a spectacle of herself? I've heard she's trying to land a role in Date My Dad, a third interjected. The talk about the naked bint died down as the three cheerleaders approached. Some in the crowd produced their phones and took pictures, while a brave few requested selfies with the girls. You in a band? someone shouted. I love the look, another yelled. Terry and his friends skulked near the PA stack, surreptitiously smoking joints and swigging bottles of local cider. Spotting Betty, Selina and Glenda, they called them over. I didn't think you'd go full on fancy dress, Terry said, impressed by their zombie attire. The girls didn't respond, instead glaring at him as drool dribbled from their open mouths. Dane in character, eh? Freddy said. Terry, do you have the girls' drinks? You know, the special ones. The lads laughed as Terry produced the reserved bottles of cider which he'd liberally laced with LSD. Come on, you've got some catching up to do, he said with a leer as he handed the bottles around. Jug em down, girls. Zed Leplin will be on later and you'll want to be in the right mood when they play. The others laughed as the girls greedily swallowed down the spiked drinks. As the next band shuffled onto the stage, Terry watched the cheerleaders, trying to work out whether the acid was kicking in. Their zombie act was getting a bit irritating, as it made it difficult to tell how fucked up they were. On a few occasions, he asked Selina how she was feeling, but instead of answering, she continued to dance, her jerky movements and distant expression masking whether or not the drugs were having an impact. Charlie sidled up to Terry and quietly asked, What's going on? Are we going to drag them behind the stage and take turns on them before Zed Leplin play? Terry nodded, muttering, Just give it a bit longer. I want to make sure they're properly strung out before we make our move. They look pretty fucked up to me, Charlie said, shrugging. I think we should get on with it. Have a little patience, Terry said, a twisted grin dancing across his lips. 
The bitches will regret ever meeting us by the time we've finished with them, and no one will believe they've been raped, not with the way they're dressed and the amount of LSD in their systems. Glenda gyrated to the pulsing music, the throbbing bass line making every fibre in her being tingle. It was like being trapped inside a kaleidoscope, the vibrant colours flashing as she shook her head to the wailing guitars. Still sated from the feast of Betty and Selena's gore and organs, she allowed the strange feelings to envelope her, cocooning her in a psychedelic haze. Someone put their arm around her, twirling her in different directions, the music fading slightly. Her body was moving, but it was akin to floating as she drifted in whatever direction she was steered. Then she felt a hand touch her between the legs, not friendly or gentle, but intrusive and cruel. Snapping her eyes open, a face hovered inches from hers, snarling, leering, lacking in passion. Glancing around, she spotted Betty and Selina, who were also being pushed and steered away from the crowd towards the rear of the staging. The man pushing Glenda snarled something unintelligible, his words blurring into the frantic echoing music. As she stared at him, his skin appeared to melt, a writhing sea of tiny maggot-like creatures oozing from under his cracked and fractured face. In that moment, she felt the hunger rising in her guts. As her assailant grew more aggressive, Glenda laughed, a deep, resonant, burbling laugh of mockery and contempt. He froze, an expression of fear replacing the malice, but before he could react, Glenda's jaw snapped closed on his throat, her teeth piercing his esophagus, the warm, bubbling blood gushing into her ravenous mouth. Charlie fell backwards, and Glenda dived on top of him, her teeth tearing at his face. A shrill scream of pain and terror mingled with the howling music emanating from the stage. Raising her fist, Glenda brought it down with astonishing force. There was a loud crack as his skull fractured. Raising it again, she smashed and punched until her cold fingers could jab through the shattered bone. Pulling out globs of hot, sticky, unctuous brains, she slurped up the delicacy. As she did, the moist warmth between her legs intensified. Betty was sitting astride Freddy's chest, and she was beating him around the face with his dismembered penis. Behind her, Selina had Terry and Andy in headlocks, one under each arm. With the strength of a frenzied animal, she drove their skulls together as if opening a pair of walnuts. Glenda lowered her mouth, placing her lips on Charlie's right eye. With a huge suck, she managed to get the eyeball out and into her maw. Biting down hard, she felt the eye burst, the viscous liquid flooding down her throat before her molars ground up the crunchy retina. As she stooped down to suck out his other eye, the PA echoed, Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise for the one and only Zed Leppelin. One last visit to Orchard Rest Campsite. Professor Goodtime sat alone on his bed, naked. Then music drifting over from Turdy Farm had finally ended, but much as he wanted to sleep, he couldn't stop the madness whirling in his head. The past 24 hours had been insane, but even now he struggled to piece together what had happened. Was Glenda dead? Had he fucked a corpse, or did he rape a schoolgirl? Where had she gone? Was anyone coming to arrest him? Curling up in the soiled sheets, he wept like a child. He'd wasted his life, thrown away all his achievements. He'd be sacked from his job and probably end up in a sex offender's secure unit. The other prisoners would hate him and doubtless try to harm him. His friends and family would shun him. He'd lost everything, all because of one little mistake. As he lay sobbing, the scent from the stains on the bed sheets filled his nostrils. The stench of Glenda's rotten cunt foam tickled his olfactory nerves and he felt his cock stiffen. The memory of sliding his fox stick into a froth and gash was overwhelming. Kneeling up, he started to stroke his shaft as the tears tumbled down his cheeks. This was how it all ended, crying and wanking. Without warning, the caravan door burst open, an otherworldly force splintering the wooden frame. John Goodtime squealed in fear as he anticipated the brutality of those who'd come to get him, but it wasn't the police or a vigilante mob. It was Glenda. Spotting his throbbing gristle, she pointed and growled one word. Meat! John Goodtime held out his arms in a welcoming embrace. 
Oh, Glenda, darling, he cried, I can't believe you're back. Come and fill yourself with Daddy's meat. As Glenda staggered towards him, he lay back on the bed, ready for his journey into never-ending ecstasy. The End Glenda Gash, Charity Box Spring, Betty Box, Doris Clawhammer, Selena Snatch, Amelia Angeline, Professor Goodtime, Ralph Understatement, Tarquin, Sancho Panza, Bob, Jeff Laundromat, The Tomb Rat, Minty Cockles, Bint in the Mud, Rack Producer, Terry Funicular, Director, Terry Funicular, Screenplay, Peter Caffrey, Distribution, Drew Stepper. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications.